Today we're going to think a little bit more about Romans chapter 5 and verses 12 to 21. This is not an easy area, and we start to do Romans 5, 6, and 7. Now these are parts of the Bible that people have written whole books on chapters, like Martin Lloyd-Jones has written a book on 3, on 4, on 5, on 6, on 7, on 8. So, and that contains many, many talks on that one section. So we're never going to really get to that sort of level of depth. But I would encourage you to take things on a little bit as you can yourself. And uh, don't, don't try to get to understand everything. In our understanding of the Bible, it's a journey. It takes time. We read, we reread. We get insights from various places and various people. We test their, their views and their ideas against the whole of Scripture. But one of the things I always find is when I come to a passage, there's usually a kind of a, an entry point that allows you to find that which helps you figure out something. And that entry point for me today with regard to Romans 5, these verses 12 to 21, is this idea of being connected, connectedness or connections. You know how it is in the north of Ireland here. People are very good in beginning to get to know all about you. So once you meet someone, they find out, you know, uh, things like, um, and oh, so where are you from? And and then when you tell them where you're from, ah, oh, do you know such and such? And then they you maybe find some common individuals that you both know. And, and then you start to fit all the connections together. And on the basis of those connections, you start to have well, maybe different perspectives on their life or, or who they are and so forth. Well, I mean, if they know that person, that's a good thing. If you're, especially if you're looking for someone in maybe some area of business or something, you're looking for someone who to employ, to trust in some way, you discover, all oh, right, so you know them and, and you've done work for them and they've employed you, da-da-da. Great. And that gives you a sense of confidence as you go forward. Well, in reality, there are only two connections of significance. There is a connection that every human being has with our original father, as it were, Adam, the original Adam. And if we're Christians, there's a connection that we have with the second Adam, that's Jesus. And both of those are really, really important. The connection with our first Adam is described for us here in this passage of Romans 5. And let me read what it says, verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And then, of course, later on we will read verse 18. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. And so this connection between either Adam or Jesus is so, so crucial. And that's what I want to think about for a few moments. There's no question that everybody experiences death in this world. Why does death take place? Death happens not just because of a biological reason, but death is actually a penal, a penal event. It's the judgment of God upon humanity. And so you can read that before the law was given, death reigned, meaning that people still suffered the penalty for sin. They died. The law came with Moses, and of course that then just gave people in an objective upon which they could then see their guilt. The law is our school teacher to show us where we fail and to lead us to Jesus Christ. And so, by being united with Adam, we find ourselves all to be, as it were, under this compelling power of sin. Now, in chapter 6, which we'll look at tomorrow, we'll think about that whole question of sin and its power and what Jesus has done to that. But let me just read you a couple of quotations from Martin Lloyd-Jones to save you going to get the book and starting to read for yourself. He says, The main argument in this section of Romans, the main statement, the main thrust of the whole paragraph is to tell us 
As we are all related by nature to Adam, so we who are Christians are related by grace to Jesus Christ. So this is basically where we are at. That we are related, every single human being is related to Adam, and in his fallen act we all inherit that as well. We demonstrate that. We know that to be a fact of life. Sin, disobedience, self-will. That's so evident in every human life. But then, of course, we are also, if we are Christians, we are related to the gracious work of Jesus. And that's marvellous. Now, Adam's experience of sin it brings to us this nature of death and sin. But the Lord Jesus Christ does something very different. What does he do? Well, let me read you just a couple of quotations again from this little book I'm reading here. And it's about grace. We experience this wonderful abounding grace of Jesus. Death is non-productive. Death is the end. Death is final. Death does not produce fruit. Death, by death definition, is something which is completely unfruitful. But then he goes on to talk about grace. Grace always abounds. Grace must never be thought of in this statical, mechanical and mercenary terms. Let us look at grace and analyse it, he says a little. It doesn't simply mean that we are simply forgiven. We are forgiven. but. Salvation does not stop there. It includes much more than putting us back to where Adam, Adam was before he fell. It means it takes us into a much, much greater place. It says that we are in Christ, and Adam was never in Christ. We're no longer in a state of probation and liable to fall, because that's where Adam was. He was made, but in a kind of form of probation. He could fall. He says... And I quote Martin Lloyd-Jones, I say that in Christ we are not on a state of probation and that there is no possibility of our falling from grace. See the difference? In Adam, even if we had been taken back to be like Adam, that was nothing what God had planned for us. He wants to do something even more. Again, and I quote Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says, In Adam we were united to a man, a created human being. But Jesus Christ was not created. He is the only begotten Son of the Father. Begotten, not created. He was born as a man, but not created. And this is something marvellous because now we are no longer united to a man. We are united to the one who is the God-man. And isn't that really what's so important? We are united by faith to Jesus Christ. And that, of course, is what we call union with Christ. You and I, if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, have been literally brought into that Trinitarian family. We are united literally to Jesus Christ. And because of that, all this grace abounding flows to us. And we're no longer just put back in Eden. We are put in the most wonderful place. And we have yet to experience the fullness of that. I want to end by quoting a rather more lengthy quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. And this is what he says. Is this Christ to you where you can say, I believe my sins are forgiven? Or are you actually rejoicing in it and receiving of his fullness? Are you aware of his meeting your every need? I am more and more convinced that it is only when you and I and others who are members of the Christian church are rejoicing in this abounding grace as we ought to be, that we shall begin to attract people who are outside the church that is my understanding of evangelism. If you and I and all the other Christians walk through this world as men and women who are experiencing the abundance of grace this much more, we should find that people would stop us at work and in business or the profession or on the street and they would say, tell me, what is it? I want to know about it. I want to know for myself. But as it is far too often, they look at us and say, if that is Christianity, then I do not want it. Well, I think what he says is true, at least in my own experience of my own life. I am not anywhere near as abounding in joyfulness as I ought to be, but you can understand how when meditating upon what has happened to us, 
that we are now no longer in Adam but in Christ and all that flows from that that we really have something to sing about and shout about and live for no matter what we're facing today because you're in Christ today no matter what else you can say about your life and that's really what matters let's meditate upon that and let's shout that out through our lives